How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for uh, going to do this. Yeah, absolutely. So I can just kind of focus more on roles that you might not have uh, ever talked about or talked about as much. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's over 600 roles I've done, so that's uh, there's a lot of different roles we could talk about. Yeah. So um, just starting from the beginning, uh, I was wondering how you got into SAG when you moved to California. <laughs> how I got into SAG? Wow. Uh, well, actually, the way I got into SAG was I, I came to L.A. to be an on-camera guy. So uh, uh, the way I got into SAG was I, I was going to school at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, I had a full drama scholarship, which was nice. It paid my tuition and everything. And uh, I did a lot of plays while I was in Tucson. <clears throat> did a lot of leads and plays and uh while i was in tucson i did a commercial i don't even remember what it was for so some commercial i did and it was a it was a union commercial and i was able to to join the union from that and then uh, later on uh, i got a little part on a show called petricelli which is it was way before your time i'm sure you probably don't even remember <laughs> but it was they they shot it in Tucson and uh, I did a I did that and I did a couple little things there before moving to to California and uh, so that's how I got my SAG card. That's you know what no one's ever asked me that so that's a, that's a good question. Uh -huh. I, I like when people ask me questions that not everybody asks me the same question. Now. Yeah. And so did you? Was it uh, about 1980 that you moved to LA? It was probably maybe late, you know, the end of uh, the 70s, early 80s uh, that I moved out here because uh, I remember one of the first things I did uh, when I got out here was uh, I did I, I, I did some voice work on and in, in this little weird place for a while. I was doing some some crazy voice work for some live action movies, doing uh, some wall and stuff like that. And uh uh, I just yeah, remember the 80s, we, we started doing uh, Robotech and a few of those other shows that kind of really propelled my career. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was, a, it was uh, I graduated around uh, 78 and I came out here not long after that. So it had to be maybe 79, 80, something like that when I first came out to LA. I honestly don't remember. But I came out here. I had a drum set and I sold my drum set and I got $300 yeah. and that was all I had in my pocket when I, when I drove out here, I had $300 in my pocket and, uh, and I've done pretty well for myself. I have to say from that $300. So, uh, I, you know, it's, I, I feel bad for the, the guys today, the kids today, because it's just, uh, I think it's a lot more, a lot more difficult. I don't think you can go anywhere for $300 today. You know, it's okay. like, uh, one night at a hotel and maybe some lunch. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's about it. Well, I did read too. I know that uh, one of your first um, acting jobs like in LA was doing Castle Dracula. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I uh, um, Somebody told me about that and they were having auditions and, you know, I was at the time I was scrambling, trying to find work, you know, it was just very difficult. And, uh, I think I was working at a clothing store for a while, you know, to try to make some money to stay afloat. And uh, I didn't, I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to be an actor. And uh, so there was this audition at Universal and I went there and there was about 200 guys there at the uh, audition for Dracula. And I had played Dracula in a, uh, in a school play. So I felt an affinity towards the character. I just went in and I got it and I booked it. And, and I did that for a couple of years, I think. And it, it turned out to be a great job because I only had to work like uh, three days out of the week or something like that. And the other times I could go on auditions, I could do jobs. So it turned out to be really a good gig for an actor. And yeah. all the other people were actors in the show. And we would, if somebody would get a job, we would, you know, we would switch back and forth. There was three of us, three Three, three Draculas, three Hulks. We had to fight the Incredible Hulk for some reason. I don't know why Dracula and the Hulk were together. But uh, and uh, when there was three Renfields, so if any of us got a, a job or you know a, an audition, we could switch with the other one. So it, it was really an ideal job for uh, for actors starting out. It turned out to be a really good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and then I went on from there. But uh, yeah, 
<laughs> You've done your homework. Yeah. And uh, was it also true that, uh, was that how you first met Michael Sorich? Michael Sorich and I, yes, yes. Michael was, uh, he was the, uh, I guess he was one of the substitute announcers at the, uh, at uh, one of the shows, Universal. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know Michael at the time. Michael's, uh, he's a nut. I don't know. Uh, you know, we've been good friends for many, many years. And uh, I love Michael. And we play golf together on occasion. But uh, uh, at the time, I didn't know him. And he was, uh, he wanted to hang with us, I guess, because we were, we were actors. And everybody else in the other shows weren't really actors. So he always wanted to come up and hang with us. We had this thing at Castle Dracula. It was a, like a green room, big green room. Where all, we all hung out between the shows. Mm -hmm. And he would always try to sneak up there, and he'd always get thrown out, you know, because he wasn't, you know, he wasn't part of our show. But uh, and I and I didn't know him uh, that well back in those days. But then uh, we we got to be friends and uh, started working on a lot of uh, voice stuff together, actually. And did you and um, Ellen meet on a movie set, or actually, Ellen and I uh, met before uh, Castle Dracula. We were, um, this is another really bizarre story. I had just kind of come into town and I was, as I said, I was working at a clothing store, not very happy about it. And uh, I was taking my, my garbage out one morning and there was a guy there who I used to go to school with. And actually the guy who told me about the apartment because I, I wouldn't have known where to go or what to do or anything. So. Uh, he told me about this apartment in Studio City, which is where I was living. And I happened to take my garbage out one morning, and he was taking his garbage out one morning. And I said, what are you doing today? He said, I'm going to a, a theater to audition for, you know, repertory theater. I said, do you mind if I tag along? He said, uh, sure. So <clears throat> I went along with him, and uh, I auditioned, and he auditioned, and I got the part. He didn't. And uh, Ellen was part of the company, and then I saw her, and I, uh, I immediately uh, fell in love with her. I, I was like love at first sight, and I just uh, really liked her, and I was attracted to her. And uh, she was dating a guy at the time, so it was uh, made it uh, made it tough. And I didn't want to, you know, bust up her relationship, so I had to wait till she had broken up with this uh, other guy before I could make my move. But uh, but it all worked out, and we've been uh, this this year. We'll be have we'll have been married forty years, if you can believe that. Yeah, I know I'm only thirty five, so I don't know how that happened. But uh, I've never been good at math. But uh, that's uh, yeah. But yeah, it all worked out, and uh, and you know, I always tell people that you know life is 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 interesting because you never know. It's like had I been, you know, five minutes later to take my trash out that day, I might not have met my my wife and my kids wouldn't have been born. And, you know, it's just kind of weird how stuff happens in life, you know? Right. So. And was that, was that also before or after, uh, like your first on camera gig in LA? Probably. I, I, uh, you know, I started doing, uh, I did some soaps. Uh, I got some good parts on some soap operas for a while. And I did a lot of these, uh, we had, when, when I was first starting out, they had a lot of these courtroom dramas, you know, like Divorce Court and uh, uh, some of these other shows. I can't even remember the names of them so long ago. But they were really fun shows, and they, were, they went through a lot of actors. And so if you were an actor, uh, you know, chances are you'd, you would have worked on one of these shows because they just were like, you know, they needed actors constantly. Every day they needed a whole new, you know, group. So uh, everybody worked on these shows, and the Superior Court was the other one, the, the other big one. Superior Court, Divorce Court, and there's another one we did. Um, but yeah, they were a lot of fun. You know, got to play some crazy characters. I played a cross-dressing dad in one of them. It was kind of fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, those were uh, those were uh, those were really fun fun times. And then I did a lot of soaps, as I said, and I started doing some some episodic television uh, later on and did uh, 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 Diagnosis Murder and uh, 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 Mat Matlock and, uh, you know, uh, Highway to Heaven, a bunch of these, uh, like Cheers, a bunch of these other shows. Uh, so I did that and, uh, you know, and once I kind of got into the voice thing, 
uh, it just kind of blew up and I was working constantly. So it was kind of hard to, to go back and do the on camera stuff. Although I really miss the on camera stuff and, uh, I would love to do more of it now at this point. And I'm kind of looking to get back into it. I've just got a new on camera agent again. So, so we'll see, uh, hopefully I'll be doing some more on camera stuff, but, uh, I do love doing the voice stuff and it's been, it's been a great, uh, great ride for me so far. So I, I really can't complain, you know, mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's kept me working and busy, and it's been a lot of fun, and I've been able to be very creative. So that's been, been a lot of fun. Well, I know some uh, really, really interesting voiced roles uh, that I hadn't seen you talk about either is that you got to be Frank in, in, the, like, in the anime Frankenstein movie. Yes. I was Frankenstein. I was yeah. the monster. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. I vaguely remember that. Yeah, it was kind of a cool-looking animation, as I recall. Uh, yeah, you know, I've, uh, I've been able to do a lot of really fun, different characters. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> and you got to play, uh, like the, uh, the devil in in tomb of Dracula too. That was, uh, yes, I played the devil a few times. Uh, I think they're trying to tell me something, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, it's funny. There was one, I don't know if it was a game. I think it was a game where I got to play the devil and God in the same game. So yeah. that was really cool. And uh, that was that was an interesting uh, job. I like that a lot. That was fun. But then again, it's kind of like when I, in Mortal Kombat, when I play Raiden and the Joker, I play these two diametrically opposed characters that are just very, very different. And, uh, and then I actually have scenes with them together talking to each other, which is, which is really fun. I know it would have been a kind of later on too but um what are your thoughts on genma and ninja scroll you know it's funny i did ninja scroll so long ago and uh, i had never seen it i never saw the show oh so i'm I, i'm on a plane I, I went to a convention and they gave i they you know i i mentioned that i had never seen the thing and they gave me a uh, a DVD of it, and of course, at those those days, you actually had DVDs in your computer, so you could watch them on your laptop. So I was watching the uh, the thing on the the laptop, and there I don't know if you remember the movie or not, but there's this part where the giant comes over and he takes this little girl, and I guess he takes her clothes off and starts licking her. And I'm 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 looking around, and everyone's looking at me like I'm a pervert. So I turned that off, and I I watched it later on. But uh, yeah, it was really it's a great actually a really great movie, and. Uh, I really, uh, after having seen it, it was kind of funny that, it, you know, and it's, it's most of the stuff I do. I don't really get a chance to see most of the stuff I do. But it was really fun to see the movie and uh, see how everything kind of pieced together with it. And uh, and he was, a, he was a really a fun character to play. Mm -hmm. Really fun. And do you have a personal preference for darker roles as opposed to lighter roles or either? You know, I... I I love them both. Uh, you know, it's like, for example, you know, going back to the Joker and Raiden, uh, you know, the Joker's a lot of fun. He's just evil and you can just be as crazy as you want. And, and he's just really a fun character to play. Um, but I do love playing Raiden because Raiden has a lot of uh, honor and a lot of nobility about him. And I call him like the ultimate father figure. You know, he really kind of is. He just, he's always advising everybody, <laughs> telling him what to do. And, you know, uh, but he's usually, he comes from a very good place. And he, you know, except when he's dark rating, of course. But, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's a very noble and honorable character. And I, and I do really enjoy playing heroes as well as villains. So uh, it's fun. The villains are a lot of fun to play, though. You get to get to really chew the scenery sometimes, so it's kind of fun. Mm. But I, I love them all. They're you know they're all a lot of fun. Is there a single um, anime role that stands out where you've had to get the most emotionally involved headspace for? You know, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of really good animes out there, and uh, and I think the thing that uh, that really uh, hooks people into these animes is <clears throat> a lot of the animes they ask really hard questions and uh, I don't think uh, American animation really does that very much uh, I think they're starting to do it more and more but I think they're getting that from anime because anime would get into some really really heavy 
and you know topics and things like that um you know uh i just i did recently uh uh joseph joestar and jojo's bizarre adventure and he's a he's a wonderful character he is he has his ups and downs and he's he's all over the place and he's he was a lot of fun to play um about tone goes in the shell but he he's usually uh he's he gets introspective sometimes but he's usually pretty much on an even keel um there was one character it wasn't an anime but it was a uh a game again called uh uh xenosaga yeah I played uh, Ziggurat Eight in that, and he uh, he definitely has a lot of pathos. He uh, he his family was killed, and he want, he killed himself essentially, and they they uh, they brought him back to life, and they're basically making him do their bidding. And uh, he has a there's a lot of sadness to his character. So he, as an actor, he he was uh, really uh, a lot of fun to play. Uh, because of, of his levels and because of his uh, emotionality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, occasionally you get those characters and as an actor, it's really, you know, it's wonderful to play those kinds of characters. So, yeah, you're asking great questions, by the way, but these are really good questions because people don't ask me this stuff. So I love this because it's not oh. the same, same old, same old, you know, because people yeah. ask me the same questions over and over again. Well, yeah, I actually, um, the Xenosaga series is one of my favorite series and it is, um, it's really impressive how good the writing is. Well, the guy, the guy who created it, or and, and I, I believe did the the writing of the scripts, uh, was a very interesting guy. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know what, remember his name right now, but uh, he we were supposed to do five of those. Oh, and we did three, and apparently he would go out to the desert, and he would meditate. And from his meditations, he would get the ideas for the games. Oh. And uh, for some reason, I, I this is a story I was told. I don't know if it's true or not, but he apparently went out the fourth time and never came back. So maybe he didn't come up with the story or something, or I don't know what happened to him. It'd be curious. It'd be interesting to find out what happened to him. But uh, because, we, like I said, we were we were we were slated to do five of those games, and we only did three of them. Yeah. And I know that uh, you know when I go to conventions, I know people really love that series. So uh, it would be it'd be very cool to uh, to to finish those last two games. I would love that. Mm -hmm. I know you've been playing uh, Dong Zhuo and Dynasty Warriors for a really long time. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's he's a he's a he's, he's speaking of crazy characters. He's a lot of fun too. He's a, just a big pompous, bombastic, uh, crazy narcissist, and uh, uh, much like our ex president. But uh, anyway, he uh, uh, he uh, he was a crazy character and, and uh, a lot of fun to do him. He loved he loved women, power, and booze. So you know you can't really you can't fault him. <laughs> well, but he was well, like he was a lot of fun to play yeah well my my personal favorite role of yours probably is mitsukake and fushiguro uh, yes i know a lot of people love that i should actually get uh you know i have pictures that's he's one i don't have a picture of i should de definitely get him but it was that was a long time ago wasn't it that, that came out mm -hmm. long time ago yeah but it's funny, a lot of people do come up to me and they do like Mitsukaki. He's one of their favorites. I'll have to maybe get another picture of him. I just got a, you know, you, you, when you go to conventions, you have, I have different pictures and I've, I've got over 600 characters that I play. So, you, you know, I obviously can't have all the characters on the table. I try to have, you know, maybe uh, 10 or 12 of the, the, the more popular ones. Um, so I had a lot of people asking me for Bobo Bo. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to get I had to get him. So I have Boba Bo now, uh, you know, as part of my repertoire. But uh, yeah, I, I should do a Mitsukaki one because uh, you're not the first person to tell me that. A lot of people really like that. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Was there anything that um stands out from being? Because I know that Bridget Hoffman directed that. Yeah. Yeah, Bridget, Bridget and I are old friends, and she's a lovely, lovely person and a wonderful actress. And, uh, and uh, there was a period of time where I was directing a lot of live action stuff. And I still am. I, I just finished a show called uh, Danny Who, 
mm-hmm. which is I believe is going to be on Paramount Plus, and it's a really cool series. I directed the ADR on it, and it's it's if you get a chance to see it, it's a really cool series, and I and we did a great job on it. It came out great. Um, but anyway, I used to do a lot of that stuff. And Bridget was, uh, Bridget did a lot of uh, uh, lead female voices for me in those, back in those days. And uh, so, yeah, it was kind of fun to have her direct me. She and her husband, uh, Rick, now do a lot of uh, Walla stuff. They do Walla for movies and that sort of thing, TV shows. And, uh, and actually her husband and I were on a, brief series together he and i i believe this is where i first met him was on a thing called uh, women in prison oh, yeah. and i was i was a prison guard and then he was a prison guard and then we became friends from that uh and you know like i've met a bunch of uh, people like bo billingsley when i was doing uh santa barbara he and i became friends and uh you know it's funny we all kind of wound up in the voice business <laughs> you know but uh uh, but Bo still does a lot of on camera uh, from time to time, and uh, you know it just depends on you know you n- you never know in this crazy business where you, where your career is going to take you, what what uh, road it's going to take you down. I've just I've been very very lucky and blessed that I've been working nonstop since that that first uh, you know first uh, voice thing that I did. I've just been continually working, doing that, and directing and writing, and uh, so it's turned out to be a really good thing for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't want to go back to um, on camera. I think would would one of your first LA on camera jobs be in Jesse? That was yeah, that was one of my uh, my first ones, and that was a very I had a nice part in that, a really big part, and I got to work with uh, well, Tony Lobianco was in it, and uh, uh, Lindsay Wagner, Lindsay Wagner, and um, oh, I'm trying to remember his name. He was married to. Uh, Lauren Bacall, not Humphrey Bogart, but the guy after her. But he was in the Dirty Harry movies. Uh, so it was really fun. It was fun to work with him because I'm a big fan of Clint Eastwood and I love the Dirty Harry movies. And uh, I used to do my, my Clint Eastwood impersonation for him every day. And he would laugh. Um, but he was a super nice guy. And uh, I was supposed to be his, uh, you know, the guy that got under his skin all the time and uh, bothered him. And it was, it was a fun, at one point he chokes me out, uh, but it was a, it was a really fun, uh, fun to work on that. And, uh, I, you know, I did a, I did a bunch of those shows for a while. I was, I was, uh, I was, uh, cropping up in a lot of those shows. I played a lot of cops, a lot of bad guys. And, uh, and that's the thing about film is you're, you're basically relegated to the way you appear. Whereas on voice, uh, acting, you can be any character that you can imagine vocally. Yeah. So it, it's almost, in a way, it's almost, uh, you know, more creative. My wife and I get in arguments about that because she's a very serious uh, theater actress. And uh, uh, she keeps telling me, no, that's not true. But uh, um, I think in many ways it is true. <laughs> I think you could be very, uh, uh, very creative and come up with all kinds of characters that you couldn't really because of your physical limitations, the way you look, you know, and uh, I can be anybody that I can come up with a voice for vocally. But, uh, you know, if I go in an audition for something that I'm, that I don't look like the character, they're not going to hire me. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, what is, the, what is the case where you've had to alter your voice the most? Do you think for a role? Probably the Joker. I mean, he's very, very different than my, my normal voice. As a matter of fact, when I first got the part and they announced it, people were freaking out because a lot of people only knew me from Bateau and Ghost in the Shell, and they thought I was going to use that voice as the Joker, and it's like, no. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are a lot of voice actors like H. John Benjamin, for example, who basically he uses his same voice in every character. And uh, there are a few voice actors like that who do that and i'm not i'm not trying to uh bad mouth them or talk them down or anything like that they're they're wonderful at what they do h john benjamin's terrific but i'm just saying they pretty much play themselves in every character and that's what you do when you're in television on camera you basically play yourself in, in every role but um the thing that i love about voice acting is you can 
is I like to be able to change my voice to become that character. Mm -hmm. So if they can show me a picture of the character or something, I'll, I'll come up with a voice to, to make it sound like it's coming out of that character's mouth. And that to me is, is, uh, is the fun of it, you know, mm -hmm. which isn't to say I don't, I don't use my regular voice in a lot of characters. Cause I do, I do. I mean, you know, listen, they, you know, Bato and Jigen and uh, Raiden sound very similar, but they're different. There are, there are subtle differences about them. If you listen to them, there's very, you know, because I become those characters. So there, there is, even though I'm using my normal speaking voice for the most part, there's differences with those characters. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that'd be the same case too with uh, Hiko, Seijiro, and Moroni Kenshin. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Eco, kind of the uh, predecessor for Raiden in a way, wasn't he? So it's kind of funny. I mean, when you think about it, those characters, kind of led me to those to these other characters in a way, you know. But yeah, it's interesting. I was going to ask what what uh, since you've obviously been part of both Kench and Dubs, what was the story of how you first got involved with uh, the series? Um. You know, it, it's another one that was so long ago that uh, it's hard to remember. But, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I say this and people are kind of shocked about it. But, you know, honestly, uh, very, very few times do they cast me where I don't have to audition. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Maybe I can count it on one hand where they've just given me the part. And it, it happens sometimes. And it does. I mean, I do get cast for stuff that I, that I don't audition for. But generally, you have to audition for everything. So I'm pretty sure. Uh, I probably I had to audition for that part, and and then you could you know I got cast thankfully. Now they're bringing uh, they're bringing some of those shows back like Bleach and uh, yeah, and I think uh, I think Kenshin's got a thing too where they're uh, where Hiko's got his own story or something like that. And I hope you know, I hope they bring me back to do them. We'll see. You know, mm -hmm. these uh, companies are not known for their loyalty, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Is there a, what about in terms of um, directing, like the Samurai X dub? You know, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of crazy stuff in that show. And I, I think we did a really great job on it. I, I like our version better, to be honest with you. But they, the company that owned it uh, didn't want any, any humor in it for some reason and basically uh, turned it over to another company to redo it again. And, and it was, ironically, I was, I was cast in that one too. So, you know, it was kind of funny, but, uh, um, I mean, that, and that's happened a few times too. Uh, like with Ghost in the Shell, I did, uh, I did Innocence. I did the movie where I wrote and directed and played Bateau in that. And then for some reason, uh, like five years later, uh, the company who did the series got the go ahead to do the movie again. And they hired me to do to play Bateau. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was kind of bizarre, you know, doing that movie again with a different script. So it, it just kind of, to me, it didn't really make sense. But uh, that's what they wanted to do. And that happens sometimes, you know. You know, that's, uh, they control it. It's their project. So they can do what they want with it, I guess. But it's just kind of weird to me how that happens. And it happens uh, occasionally, you know. I mean, for example, uh, uh, Loop on the Third, Castle Caliostra. It's been dubbed, I don't know how many times, five or six times. Now they're talking about doing it again with our cast, which would be, I think, would be fabulous. I would love that. Is there also a, any interesting story involved with um, the Street Fighter Two movie? I actually did a lot of stuff on Street Fighter. Yeah. A lot of different versions of Street Fighter. And it was kind of funny when they, I guess they redid it and... Uh, uh, the guy who who did the the newer versions, I, I bumped into him at a convention, and I said, "You do know I I did the voice of Hondo?" He said, "I didn't know that," and because uh, I guess he cast somebody else to play that character in the new version. I, and so I kind of gave him a hard time about it, but it worked out because ultimately he did uh, Street Fighter Five, and he cast okay. me as Akuma. So <laughs> so it all came around full circle again, I guess. So now I'm doing Akuma, and Akuma is a very another very popular character that I do. So that's that's been kind of fun too. Although he's a, 
he's a tough character because he, he's a you know he's a very very like just screaming all the time and it's all in your throat and it's just uh, it's kind of like gargling battery acid by the end of the session you know so he's a tough one but uh, he's a fun character he's a, he's a he's a big badass and uh, very popular character and I heard the guy who got the championship uh, gaming thing used him to win so I thought that was kind of cool yeah. Is, do you think that's the case where it's been the most difficult to sustain a voice as Akuma? Uh, he's definitely one of them. I mean, anytime you have to scream, you know, like we, I, I do a lot of these Call of Duty games and, you know, where you're just screaming the whole time. There's really not like you're not having any, you know, conversation or dialogue. You're just basically screaming. And those are, those are the tough ones just because it's just uh, vocally stressful and, uh, you know, those are the hard ones to maintain. Now, when I was in my younger days, I sound like old man McGee here, but in my younger days, uh, I could I could do that for hours and hours and hours and it didn't bother me. But as I'm getting older, I'm seeing it's it's taking its toll on my throat. So, uh, you know, you want to not do more than uh, two hours of that at a time if you can. Now, with Akuma, it was tough because my schedule was insanely crazy, which it usually is. And we had to kind of do uh, do the whole thing in two sessions, which was like two full hour, eight hour days. And that was really tough. So, um, you know, and I always kind of get myself into these situations where I have to do that. But, you know, it was the only, only way I could do it and finish it and and because uh, I had so much other stuff going on at the same time. So thankfully, it all worked out, you know, it all worked out. And uh, hopefully I'll be doing him again. We'll see. You know, who knows? This is a more modern general, but I hadn't seen you talk about that. I personally like to uh, wolf, the wolf, wolf dad and blood lad. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Uh, I'm trying to remember them too. There's so, like I said, there's so many of them. I love that you're asking me about these more obscure ones that a lot of people don't ask me about. I really love that. Um, sadly, I don't remember that. I mean, I remember the title, but I don't remember working on it i don't remember my character that much in that one but what about, uh, what about with the halloween uh in mayor oh and i played a giant pumpkin yeah <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> that was fun i mean that was a fun one i remember that uh that was done at pcb and uh we love those guys and they do a lot of the, the top games over there in fact we just did the the convention for them avox which is mm -hmm. their thing that they're doing now and uh we did it at the uh, LA Comic Con, and it was really fun. And I guess in in June, I want to say is going to be um, they're going to have another A box, the big the big real A box. They're going to have in Pasadena, so uh, that's going to be fun. We're all looking forward to doing that one as well. And this is uh, going to the topic of other people, but um, did you guys know Lisa Michelson very well? Yes, yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, she was a lovely, lovely person, and uh, and it was very, very sad when she died. And uh, uh, you know, I still know Greg. Greg. Uh, Greg lives in. Uh, Greg was her husband. Lived with. In, now lives in uh, Italy. Mm -hmm. um, although I keep hearing rumors that he's moved back here. I, I don't know, but. Uh, uh, yeah, that was a that was not a that was a that was a sad time, but she was a very very sweet, lovely, lovely person, and she was in a car accident and she was uh, pregnant at the time, which was really really sad. Mm -hmm. So that's a rough one. Do you guys have um? Did you guys know Felice Sampler pretty well too? Oh yeah, yeah. No, Felice, uh, you know, and I were in Bobo Bo, and she was beauty. Yeah. And she was uh, she was a lovely, talented, wonderful person. And uh, we hadn't seen uh, Felice for a while. And I guess she went through a rough divorce with her husband. And uh, we were starting to get friendly with her again. She's uh, she's with my agent, a uh, uh, voice agent. And uh, we run into her at the uh, holly you know holiday parties. And uh, yeah, that was a, that was a shock. Uh, that was really a shock because she still was, you know, very young, young person. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a shock. Um, I don't know what happened there, but uh, 
you know, that, it just shows you, I mean, uh, this is uh, interesting you're bringing this stuff up, but, uh, you know, I just want to put out there also that, you know, our life is, uh, is brief, it goes quickly. And, uh, you know, everybody should really just be kind to each other and, and, and try to, to, to do the things that you want to do in life because it goes quick and, uh, you know, don't put it off. If there's something you want to try or do, do it, go for it because, uh, you never know if you're, if you're going to have the chance to do it again or not do it again. So, uh, you know, every day, you know, is, is, a, is a present, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, you just have to live your life and, uh, do the best you can. And, uh, you know, all this, the stuff that's going on, this vitriol and hatred and all that stuff, I, I just wish it would go away because, you know, we all have to realize we're all in the, this boat together. You know, we all have to pull together and, and, and make the, the best of it. It's not, not make the worst of it, you know? Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's my two cents. <laughs> Well, and then uh, this is another modern Gen 1, but it's kind of like a prettier character for you, uh, Laurie Takata and Skip Beat. Oh, yeah. He was he was a really fun character. He was, he was a nutty character, uh, a narcissist who, who loves to change his clothes every five minutes. And, uh, you know, he's always wearing these outlandish outfits and, uh, you know, really, really a peacock kind of character, you know, just really like to strut his stuff and, and control everything and uh but he was a lot of fun to play, really fun character to play. What about a case with um, anime where it was hard to bring acting to a character because of how emotionless they were or something, if there's been? I never have problems with emotion. I, I'm always good with that. Like, like I say, I, I, uh, I, I love to dive deep. So that's, not, that's never been a problem for me. The only, the only thing is, like I say, that's, that's really difficult is the screaming, you know, to constantly scream. That's really... That is the tough thing. Uh, but as far as uh, getting the emotion, or I, I love that. And I love, I love uh, you know, characters that break down. I love characters that, you know, that have, uh, have emotional levels to them. Uh, there are characters like Jigen, for example, Lupin the 30s. He's pretty even keel the whole time. Very rarely. He'll get mad once in a while, but he's pretty even keel, in, you know. And... Uh, as a result, he's he's. It's nice to play him because there's no you know stressful screaming or anything like that. But um, but it is fun too to play characters that do have uh, that have emotional roller coasters that you can you know really jump in and, and, and become those characters and really really experience some of that stuff. I, I I love I love being vulnerable as a character. I love uh, I love showing that side. And I love uh, I love being able to do that stuff now because. You know, I, I, I'm known for playing a lot of villains and heroes. Uh, I don't always get to play those kinds of characters, but uh, occasionally I do, and I really, I really relish it when I do get to play those. Yeah. Well, like on the on the topic of Mitsukake too, like I always remember um, how he how he passes away by like giving uh, the whole healing power that he has, like sacrificing his whole life to save a bunch of children after a. Uh, a war and I just yeah I just thought I thought everyone was great in that but uh, especially how you handled that that was amazing. Thank you very much. I, you know I have to go back and see that. I don't know that I've ever seen that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have to, I'm going to make a note of that so I can remember. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I, I like I say I do love I do love uh, shows that that push me emotionally. I do really enjoy that. I love. Uh, playing those characters and uh, you know because it's uh you're giving humanity to the character you know and uh and i really enjoy doing that uh making those characters come to life and giving them some humanity and uh and uh you know i think that's our our job as an actor you know is to do that sort of thing so what about with the who do you think you like personally relate to the most with who you played? Are they characters? Yeah. I think there's a few of them. I think Bato definitely is somebody who I relate to. He's a, he's a, you know, a very fair person. He doesn't take crap. He, uh, he has a very dry sense of humor. Also, Jigen, uh, same thing with him. I aspire to be 
as noble as Raiden, you know, who's, who just really wants the best for everyone and tries to help everyone. Uh, you know, and then the other stuff is just, uh, you know, I think it was Anthony, Anthony Quinn, uh, an actor, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he was a big star back in the day. And he, his process was, they, they asked him how he would find his character. And his process was he would make a list of the uh, characteristics of the character and see which of those things was most like himself. Mm -hmm. So that he could uh, make that part of himself and make it authentic, give it some authenticity. Uh, and I think I do that subconsciously a lot of times. I try to, to see what, uh, what I have in common with this character. Sometimes the characters are way out there, and then you just have to fill in the gaps you know, with your imagination. But uh, sometimes there's things about the character like Bateau, Bateau is a really good fit for me, and so is Jigen, because uh, they're just very close to me naturally, you know. So, I mean, you know, those those are characters that are very easy for me to play, because they're, to me, they're very much like me. So, uh, but there are those characters that are just really out there and that are nuts, and like uh, Inspector Lungay, for example, in Monster, very different kind of character than I normally play, and uh, it was really fun being having his fanaticism and, and he's frantic and uh, you know just to play that kind of a character who's just so absorbed in his work that he just forgets everything else around him and uh, mm -hmm. you know it's just kind of really an interesting character. That's another thing I haven't seen in the uh, Patrick Sykes who directed that series has promised me he's going to send me the show which uh, he still hasn't done yet so. Patrick, if you're watching, I'm still waiting for Monster. Send it to me. I'd love to see it. Is there much of a... I would I would think that it might have been a quick recording, but um, your roles in Fire Emblem. Oh, Harden. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I think we just recently did something again for them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so that... Uh, yeah, that he was really fun. And then they... Is, is Harden the one who's like the big narcissist? Is he the... the he loves himself and everything's beautiful? Is that the one or is that the other guy? That's, a different, that's another guy. <laughs> that's another guy. Okay. Yeah. I think he's in the same show, though. That's why I'm thinking of him. But there, yeah, he was great. Uh, the one I was talking about was, I guess, Final Fantasy XIV, where I played Guys and Balsar. Uh, and, and this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. They, they had him come back again, and they had a different voice actor play him. So, okay. You know, that's, what, that's what I'm talking about. There's not a lot of loyalty in this business. But, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate with NetherRealm. God bless them. They uh, they hired me in Mortal Kombat versus DC Universe 12 years ago, and I've been playing Raiden and the Joker ever since. And I hope to continue playing those guys till I uh, till I can't uh, do it anymore. So uh, uh, those are, like I say, two of my all-time favorite characters. I love doing them, and I love being part of Mortal Kombat. And I love, you know, the, the scripts on those shows are are just fantastic. You know, they're just really meaty uh, you can really sink your teeth into them as an actor it just it's just wonderful the vignettes are great i love doing those and uh, even the uh you know when they when they show up to challenge each other for the fights there's some really funny stuff that they've written and uh, i just think the writing is excellent on those games they're really really good just some other things i hadn't asked yet with all the on-camera work that you've done and who you've worked with has there been a case where you've been the most starstruck or did you or do you not really get like that um you know it's funny i i don't really get starstruck with other actors per se uh there's been a couple of times that you know when i worked on matlock uh i had i got to work with uh, andy griffith for two weeks and that to me was kind of weird because uh when i was a kid growing up we used to watch the andy griffith show at dinner all the time so to work with him was kind of a big deal to work with peter falk was kind of a big deal he was he was a terrific person and wonderful actor and just great um i got to work with some really really cool people um when i did uh, legend of Korra, which was a voice job uh i got one in the booth and and um stephen root was in there and i'm a big fan of his work and i told him so and so that was really nice um but usually uh with actors i don't really get that uh uh you know starstruck yeah, uh, I did get a little Star Trek when I met Christina Hendricks. To be honest with you, I did get a little. I was a little. It was the first time I was a little 
you know, bye, 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 bye. <laughs> if she is to me, is very beautiful. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, normally I don't. But the one time I did get a little starstruck was uh, I ran into Ringo Starr. And, uh, and, you know, he was one of the Beatles. And to me, that was like, oh, my God, the Beatles. That's like, you know, way better than any actor, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and I asked him for his autograph, and he gave me his autograph. And I still have it to this day. Wow. So uh, that, was, that was very cool. And I was, uh, I was a little blown away by him. And he was, once again, he was very, very kind. I, I, over the years, I bumped into Elton John, Barbara Streisand, a bunch of, you know, big, big stars. And they were a little uh, like, don't talk to me, stay away kind of a vibe. So I didn't, I didn't bother them. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's always nice. And I always try to be this way with my fans. I always try to be uh, accessible and uh, kind because I know that, you know, it's uh, people enjoy that and they, they you know, they want to, they want to meet you and, uh, you know, I, I don't understand these, these actors or celebrities that treat their fans terribly. I just don't get that whole thing. I, I just think mm -hmm. it's just really bad. And usually those people don't wind up lasting very long, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I don't know. I had, I had a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I had a lot of fun in the soaps, to be honest with you. I did, I did do a lot of uh, uh, co-star and guest star stuff on television, but um, I really like doing the soaps just because, you got a lot of dialogue every day and uh, we would sometimes we get like 20 pages of dialogue and, and it was just great. And, you know, it was all, most of it was silly stuff. It's just, you know, soaps are kind of silly, but, uh, and you wind up repeating the same stuff over and over again every day. But um, it was fun because it was, it was meaty. Whereas, uh, you know, if I was cast on a TV show on primetime to do a co-star guest star, you know, Oftentimes it would be maybe a handful of lines, you know, and uh, and that would be it. But uh, but with the soaps, you know, you really got a chance to really jump in and, and uh, you know and play those characters. So it was really really fun. And one of the one of my fondest memories was with the the late Paula Kelly. I played her uh, her henchman on Santa Barbara mm -hmm. and uh, kidnapped Robin Wright of all people mm -hmm. and uh, slapped her around and injected her with blue fluids, whatever that was. And, uh, we, you know, it's just, it's just, I've been very, very fortunate. I've worked with a lot of really, really incredible people. So that, that thing's been really, really nice coming here from, uh, Denver, Colorado with 300 bucks in my pocket. I've done okay. So yeah. <laughs> and there's some other uh, random final things I was wondering about. Um, did you have much to do on B? On V, I did. I was uh, I played uh, a commander on V, and we were looking for the uh, you know the people trying to yeah. trying to kill them. And, and this particular episode was shot at uh, Warner Brothers on the back lot, and it was the uh, the western town that we worked in, and it was just kind of fun because uh, you know one of one of the shots I have to do is I have to go through one of those bars with the swinging doors like in the old westerns yeah. and i open the doors and i'm looking for them and i'm going around and then i shoot it shoot at a dog and i miss the dog but i shoot at the dog because i think it's one of the people hiding or something but you know later on i was talking to the director and i said i wonder how many times john wayne walked through those doors he said oh hundreds of times mm -hmm. hundreds of times so i thought that that was kind of cool you know uh you know it was just really fun to work on those kinds of shows mm -hmm. and with um I'm sure you've probably talked about this before, but uh, working with Daryl Hannah and Sam Neill and Chevy Chase. And they were, they were wonderful, particularly Sam Neill. Sam Neill and I, uh, and the other two uh, or three guys that played the villains, uh, Steve Barr, uh, Paul Perry, and Pat Skipper, and I were the, were the villains in that movie. And, uh, and Sam Neill was our boss and Sam couldn't have been nicer. And we, uh, you know, he was just lovely. He would he'd take us all out to dinner. He would, uh, we, we, we shot a lot in San Francisco and then we came back to LA and he rented a home here and had us over for barbecues. And I mean, we just couldn't have been nicer. He's just the nicest guy. And, and uh, and Daryl Hannah was great. And we all played poker together all the time while we were waiting, you know, cause in film, there's a lot of downtime and they're setting up shots and all that. So we'd always play poker and we got, uh, we got, 
uh, you know, Sam would always play with us, uh, but we got to Daryl to play with us a couple of times. We got uh, Chevy to play with us. And apparently Chevy used to play in a big, uh, big, heavy Hollywood game with uh, Johnny Carson and a bunch of those guys. And I guess the buy-in was 10 grand. So it was like, you know, this was like peanuts to him, but, uh, but, you know, it was just really fun and it was a great way to break the ice with everybody and get friendly. And uh, that was uh, certainly one of my most uh, favorite memories and working with uh, John Carpenter, the great John Carpenter, uh, yeah. you know, just to, uh, to be with all those people and uh, what a, what a privilege. And I met Stephen Tobolowsky, who's in a show that my wife Ellen Stern is uh, producing and writing right now called Life's a Bitch which I'm also in and uh, we're trying to get that going. We've done a couple of uh, little teasers. In fact, if you want to watch them, you can go on YouTube and put in life's a bitch, Richard Epcar or Ellen Stern, and it'll come up and there's two of them. And these are little teasers to give you an idea what the show is going to be about. And Stephen Tobolowsky is in it. And uh, it's a really kind of a fun, uh, fun show and uh, very funny. And we're trying to get uh, the money together to, to do our pilot for that. So uh, we'd love to, love to get that going and uh what else uh you know just that whole that whole experience was just a, a great great experience mm -hmm. and uh i was kind of hoping that would uh propel me into other movies but uh, that didn't really happen so much so uh you know you never know like i say you never know this business is such a crapshoot even even these guys that are you know in big series uh you know uh, for years and then they can't get arrested. You know, it's just, it's kind of a crazy, you know, it's just a crazy business. There's no guarantees in this business and you never know how it's going to play out. That's why I'm so fortunate to have this voice stuff because I'm constantly working doing voice stuff. So, uh, it's been, like I say, it's been a real blessing. Mm -hmm. Well, my final question is always asking, what do you want your um, legacy to be? Uh, I just, you know, hopefully people will appreciate, uh, my performances and, uh, and, uh, remember me as a, as a kind, good person. And, uh, you know, I always, I always try to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, like all of us, uh, I'm, I'm struggling, you know, we all have our struggles and our fights and our, our things we're trying to contend with, but, uh, you know, I, I just, uh. I hope I'm one of those people that, uh, that, that people look up to and uh, that, that I've had a variety of work and, you know, I've been, uh, been very fortunate. I have been very fortunate and I've got to work with some, some incredible people. And, uh, you know, every once in a while I have to, I have to stop and think about that. I've been very, very lucky in that respect. I've gotten to direct a lot of wonderful people too. And uh, that's been, been uh, a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, like I say, I, I, I can't complain. I've been very lucky. I've, I've played a, a wide range of characters and I just hope to continue and keep, keep doing it. You know? Well, thanks. I'm glad that we got to do this. Yeah, me too. And uh, happy holidays to everybody who's watching and uh, happy new year. I hope uh, 2022 will be a lot better than 2020 and 2021. <laughs> Although I worked a lot in 2021, we did a lot of recording. I've got a booth in my office, so we did a lot of recording at the house and uh, and directed a lot of stuff. It was crazy. Uh, uh, we did the uh, Lupin, uh, the original Lupin series. We we I directed that with my wife Ellen Stern and uh, and wrote a bunch of the episodes. Uh, the Lupin, the first, a uh, Lupin the third, the first. The movie came out in the theaters. I played. Jigen in that and also wrote the screenplay for that and uh, the adaptation I should say and uh, and I we're, we're working right now on Lupin part six yeah so uh, you know the Lupin thing just keeps going and going and going uh, which is uh, great because I love that character and he's a lot of fun but uh, yeah I uh, happy holidays to everybody I hope this uh, uh, I would just ask everybody please get vaccinated please wear masks let's get through this stupid stuff and get over with it already and stop politicizing it it's about health it's not about politics and let's all come together and get rid of it so we don't have to deal with it anymore that would be really nice that would be my my wish for a new year anyway thank you for having me i appreciate it and uh please send me a link to this and i'll, I'll promote it on my my pages okay all right thanks thank you a wonderful time you too <laughs> bye. happy new year bye-bye